Uh, so we'll move on to the next kit, which is uh, this pharmacologic management. I've got the same disclosures I had uh, an hour ago. I have no new contracts in the last hour. Um, uh, I didn't check my phone, but thank you. I'll, I'll check, uh, see if I have to change anything. Bipolar treatment paradigm. Average number of medications a bipolar patient uh, takes is four to five. And I'm not talking about to treat other conditions other than bipolar disorder. The essential medications are the mood stabilizers, uh, lithium, valproate, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, uh, and with or without uh, atypical antipsychotics. Patients are often prescribed antidepressants, uh, which increasingly may be ill-advised, benzodiazepines and medications for side effects. I always love, uh, and occasionally I will see patients on one medication, another medication for the side effects, and then a third medication for the side effects for the first side effect medication. So that's my favorite. Um, Selecting medications, uh, so there's some phase-specific considerations, prior response and tolerability, medical and psychiatric comorbidities, side effects, drug interactions, patient preferences, family history of response. So uh, basically by the end of this hour, I'm hoping to make you all into uh, expert psychopharmacologists. Not a problem. Uh, so of the mood stabilizers, lithium is the most studied uh, for acute maintenance treatment. It's got a greater effect on mania than depression, but it's got a better effect on depression than Depakote does. It is underutilized partly because uh, you guys, as am I, are worried about uh, the chronic effect on kidneys and thyroids. Uh, I don't actually worry about my effect on thyroids because I can, that I can treat. Uh, when I cause kidney damage, that I can't treat. Um, and that's more of a problem. Uh, you need to get blood tests. Uh, if you're going to have somebody on lithium, please get a 24-hour urine once a year. I do not, and I have friends of mine who will argue with me on this point and tell me that you can get a good enough calculated creatinine clearance. I have the same rule of thumb, which is I'd rather know exactly what somebody's creatinine clearance is rather than calculate it, so I'd rather have somebody collect 24 hours a year for me. Um, you know, I, I uh, believe in the uh, uh, golden rule, and I, I treat other people the way I would want to be treated. Uh, you know, I always love the golden rule for physicians is always treat somebody the way you'd want your family member treated. No, no, no. Treat somebody the way you would want to be treated. <laughs> Some members of my family, I don't know that I would treat that. Um, treat them like the family member you love most. Yeah. Or the other expression is friends of the family you would have picked. Um, so Depakote is, is, curiously enough, Depakote is not FDA approved for maintenance treatment. Never got the approval for that, and it failed in the study, but it is approved for uh, uh, acute treatment of uh, mania. There is some weight gain in cognitive dulling. Uh, Lamotrigine is my single favorite agent for bipolar type 2, meaning folks who just have uh, hypomania and depression. Uh, it is not an effective anti-mania drug. It is helpful for the depressive uh, pole. It does require a long titration, so you really have to titrate it over about six weeks to get up to an adequate dose. I consider the adequate dose window about 200 to 400 milligrams, except if you're on birth control pills and then it's 400 to 800 milligrams. Uh, carbamazepine has a clear efficacy, uh, risk of decreased platelet counts, and more likely to cause drug-drug interactions. When I was a resident in psychiatry at McLean Hospital in the early 80s, the first two patients I ever put on carbamazepine both developed thrombocytopenia. Can we guess how long it was before I put my third patient on <laughs> uh, Unapproved anticonvulsants. These are drugs that surprisingly get used a whole bunch but don't really work. Uh, and so trileptal, which is oxcarbazine, uh, has got some small trials, particularly in child bipolar, uh, but it really, I gotta say, has never really shown clear efficacy. Uh, gabapentin at one point was the most prescribed drug for bipolar disorder, despite the complete absence of evidence. Um, uh, to pyramate as well. Uh, and despite negative trials, these agents are still prescribed by clinicians, and this is the triumph of patient acceptance over efficacy. 
So uh, as far as I'm concerned with most of these agents, you could put your patients on cherry lifesavers, uh, <laughs> although that has a little bit of a cal calorie load, uh, but uh, you're not gonna get uh, uh, worse efficacy out of cherry lifesavers than you will out of some of these things. Atypical antipsychotics, uh, certainly there is no medication class that has been so marketed to all of us uh, as much as the atypical antipsychotics. Overall, no agent is clearly more effective than another. Um, there is no worsening of depression as there is with atypicals. In the good old days when I was uh, uh, still at McLean Hospital before we had the atypicals, what we would do with somebody who was manic is I'd put them on lithium and uh, a typical antipsychotic, and what would happen, they would get depressed, and they'd often have these horrific depressions. Uh, and I don't have that with the atypical use. I can treat actually uh, mania or mixed states uh, without this plummet into depression. There's a less risk of EPS, extrapyramidal symptoms, and tardive dyskinesia, but a substantially higher metabolic risk. Uh, let me just take one second to tell you my prejudice about metabolic risk. I do not believe atypical to cause diabetes. I believe that people have genetic loading for diabetes uh, and that people with chronic mental illness have a higher genetic loading for diabetes. And if you've got schizophrenia, you've got four times the risk of dis uh, diabetes. And if you've got bipolar disorder, you've got two to three times the risk of the general population for diabetes. What it does do is in people who are genetically programmed to develop diabetes is it will speed up your course in getting there. So I do not think it puts you on the moving walkway. I think it speeds up the moving walkway. So if you are programmed to get diabetes in 10 years, you might get it in five years. Um, you can also stop the progression from these agents by changing diet and exercise. My prejudice, uh, and I wish I had more evidence to back it up. Uh, uh, the general feeling is that the more effective agents have more challenging side effect profiles, and I'll give olanzapine and quetiapine, which are probably two of my preferred agents, have uh, uh, among the worst profiles in terms of metabolic syndrome. There are several agents now off patent competing against multiple very expensive alternatives with possibly better side effect profiles. And that's where, where the battle is, is being fought now, is we've got a lot of newer agents that have dramatically better side effect profiles, but is it worth it? Uh, and we're looking at agents that are costing basically about 900 bucks a month versus agents that are costing maybe 90 bucks a month. Uh, and um, there's no compelling reason to use uh, more than one agent on a single patient. Uh, sadly, within a lot of state hospital populations, you'll see people on two and three different atypicals, uh, which uh, there's no compelling reason other than, you know, these people have chronic difficult to treat illnesses. Each agent is distinct with differences in binding profiles except for patent extenders like risperidone and paliperidone. Uh, so paliperidone is uh, uh, basically a metabolite of risperidone. Uh, I will just quote the uh, director of our pharmacy at Shepherd Pratt saying, why should we pay a premium to do what the liver does for nothing? Um, so, you know, that's not something that I would view as being a compelling argument uh, for uh, an agent. The, the main compelling argument is I do like the long-acting injectable version of paliperidone, which is in Vega. Um, but uh, that aside, I, I can't find a compelling reason there. There are several agents, aripiprazole and cariprazine, that's Abilify and Vralar, are D2 partial agonists rather than antagonists. It's unclear yet if this is significant, but it does suggest a possible different mode of action. And may I think um, uh, actually make it more interesting in mood disorders. Again, my personal prejudice. Uh, and I am not involved with either of those agents uh, as a speaker or uh, uh, in, in any other way. Uh, very expensive and highly marketed drugs without clear guidelines as to when to use a given agent. Individual practitioners develop their own idiosyncratic preferences. And boy, uh, when you look at psychiatrists, we're an idiosyncratic bunch, just saying. I think you guys have figured that out, right? Um, a, f uh, a friend of mine told me that uh, she always 
thought that the people who went to psychiatry were the people who were at the top of the class and the bottom of the class. <laughs> Some new agents are entering the field, and given the lack of satisfaction with the current agents, there is a market but a high price point. Iloperidone, FANAP is approved for schizophrenia. Safris is a dissolve under your tongue drug because it's um, uh, so uh, completely metabolized by the liver, we had to find a different delivery system. Lorazidone is approved for bipolar depression. Cariprazine uh, looks kind of interesting potentially for bipolar disorder. Brexpiprazole Rexulti is approved for as a supplement for treatment resistant depression and schizophrenia. And it is kind of curious what things get approved for, which often has to do not as much with efficacy as, as uh, it has to do with marketing. Uh, typical antipsychotics are clearly effective in treating psychosis. They're dramatically less expensive than uh, typicals, even the generic ones. And these drugs are pennies a day. Um, there's a high risk of neurotoxic effects, uh, specifically tardive dyskinesia, although some good news, 2017 we'll probably see the first effective agent on the market for tardive dyskinesia. Um, in many healthcare systems, uh, they're only used after the failure of atypical antipsychotics, largely because of the long-term uh, side effect profile. And there's a high incidence of precipitating depression, as I mentioned, when using, used during acute mania. Antidepressants in bipolar disorder, and I've got to say this is one of my biggest bet noirs. Uh, they're commonly used and most likely overused. There's likely to be a genotype or phenotype that does not do well with them as well as some that perhaps do better. If I had to guess, I would say at this point, two thirds of folks with bipolar disorder do worse or no better with antidepressants and perhaps a third do better. The, there's only one study that I know of that's a large study that um, a friend of mine, uh, Lori Altshuler, did uh, in which she looked specifically at folks with bipolar disorder who were able to be stabilized on antidepressants. So a highly select population of people who were able to be stabilized. I think she had to screen 470 bipolars to get 74 that qualified. But when she uh, randomized those folks to either staying on the antidepressant or coming off, the folks who came off did worse. But generally speaking, most of the other large studies, like the STEP-BD study, shows that it, uh, there was no improvement. And with, uh, among certain populations, like rapidly cycling bipolars, it's clear that it causes a roughening, a worse uh, 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 history in terms of uh, making the illness worse. Uh, individual patients may do much worse or better, but be careful of extrapolating from anecdotal data. Another one of my favorite expressions, the plural of anecdote is not evidence. <laughs> and, and make sure you remember that because just because two of your patients did well, that's not evidence that something works for a condition. Uh, is, uh, you need scientific rigor to actually uh, create an evidence base. Benzos and sleeping pills in bipolar disorder. This is a highly substance abusing population. Uh, uh, I told you what the incidence and the point prevalence is. It should not be used for primary mood stabilization. There was a study that I was involved in when I was still a resident looking at clonazepam as a mood stabilizer. Uh, and I have a feeling it's not getting you really a stable mood, but it's calming some of the manic folks enough. Um, they're important supplements for control of agitation, anxiety, and sleep management. There is a, a person who is um, a bipolar two, very, very uh, distinguished professor in my neck of the woods that I have treated. Uh, he's got bipolar type two. The only two things I treat him with are Lamotrigine and uh, Zolpidem because one of the things that you can best do with a bipolar patient is make sure they get sleep every night. And he is somebody that a couple of nights without sleep and he's kind of off to the races making bad judgments again. Um, and uh, the fact that he takes the Zolpidem every night means I know he's gonna get at least five hours of sleep every night and I have basically been able to keep him on minimal medication uh, because of that, and I think we're up to about six or seven years. Uh, I always know how well he's doing based on whether his wife, another prominent professor, comes in with him or not. 
uh, when he's not doing well, she's there. And uh, she's basically not come in except actually for uh, another discussion because he's one of those guys that overschedules himself. And she just desperately wanted me to see his calendar uh, as to how much traveling he'd been doing. Uh, managing acute uh, mania or mixed state for moderate illness, you may be able to start with monotherapy, either lithium or valproate or even atypical. For severe illness, I always start with lithium and valproate, uh, and I may uh, even use an IM or IV delivery of an, uh, of an atypical. And you might want to consider short-term use of a benzodiazepine for control vegetation. This is generally beyond the, the, the PCP level. This is generally inpatient uh, type interventions. Uh, scan evidence, as I said, for the use of antidepressants and bipolar depression. There is one study looking at olanzapine plus fluoxetine uh, as an exception, uh, and folks did very well with that combination. I was an investigator for that study. Uh, there is evidence for the use of lithium, lamotrigine, glutiapine, and lorazidone. Those are all drugs that are approved for the use uh, uh, within bipolar depression. Uh, and there's clear evidence for ECT in severe cases and anecdotal evidence for the use of TMS. I'm currently doing a study in which I'm looking at bipolar 1 and 2 depression in which uh, I have folks on um, a mood stabilizer and giving open label TMS and my results are almost disturbingly good. Uh, I have found it to be about one of the most positive interventions for uh, a group of folks I've got very little for. Bipolar maintenance, best evidence is for lithium, olanzapine, aripiprazole as monotherapy. As I said, lamotrigine may be particularly helpful in bipolar type 2. Most often combinations are needed, lithium uh, or an anticonvulsant plus an atypical. Uh, no combination will avoid all episodes. And, and here's one of the things that people get wrong which is that people assume that the goal is to eliminate all episodes. The goal is to decrease the number of episodes and decrease the severity of episodes. It is not a failure if somebody has an episode. Do not feel like you need to change all their medications because somebody has an episode. Treat the episode uh, and consider that, uh, uh, look at what their course is before and after rather than just making the assumption that an episode means that somebody needs to have their treatment changed. Uh, at best, like I said, I'm trying to change the number and severity. Also, any medication that somebody takes is better than what you prescribe that they don't take. So if they're willing to take something that may not be as effective as something else, but they're willing to take it, the exception being all those drugs that don't work. If they're willing to take something that clearly is effective, um, but not as effective perhaps as something else, you know, I'll settle for that. Uh, it's a discussion. Um, TMS, TMS. Transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is basically uh, a neuromodulation technique in which uh, I am uh, sending uh, um, magnetic pulses to the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Uh, happy to discuss that uh, later in the question period. Uh, beyond uh, pharmacology, the single best prognostic intervention is to stop substance abuse. And so many of them are abusing substances. Uh, regular sleep-wake cycles, like I said with my uh, professor patient, uh, Getting him to sleep at night has improved the course of his illness. Uh, I don't like all-nighters, including in my college students. Uh, travel across multiple time zones are highly provocative. So I have gotten several calls from people going on a fun trip to Europe. So by the way, for bipolar disorder, going from west to east, more problematic than going from east to west. But if you cross enough time zones, then screws you up anyway. The, the point is, is that changing time zones can bring on manic episodes. Um, moderation and lifestyle can be powerful. The development of insight is often the turning point to successful management. And one of the problems is, is one of the key things that's lacking in a lot of these people is insight. And uh, if they begin to have recognition of their illness, if they begin to be willing to work with you, the course of the illness will change more dramatically than any other intervention other than stopping drinking.
Antidepressants, monoamine hypothesis. The treatment paradigm continues to be the notion that depression is caused by a deficiency of serotonin, norepinephrine, or dopamine, or some combination thereof. The FDA approved antidepressants all have some impact on one or more of these uh, neurotransmitters. Well, NMDA antagonists like ketamine, and hopefully you've seen uh, either in the professional literature or the lay literature, the fact that there may be a huge paradigm shift for all of psychiatry, because NMDA antagonists would be the first really new course of agent that we have had in psychiatry since the introduction of the atypical. And I'm currently doing some work with a couple of different NMDA antagonists. Uh, this is the, the general uh, um, diagram of the kind of things that we see get covered by serotonin, dopamine, and norep uh, norepinephrine. So norepinephrine helps more with alertness and drive. Dopamine uh, is really part of the, uh, the whole reward system. That's the reason why all addictive agents work through dopamine. Uh, and serotonin clearly helps with obsessive compulsive disorder. The, the problem that I've seen with a number of folks that are on SSRIs is these are people on, who are miserable laying on the couch, and you treat them with an SSRI, and they're still laying on the couch, but they're no longer miserable. Um, and it's because a lot of them still need some norepinephrine or some dopamine to actually get off the couch. The neurotrophic hypothesis of depression is the idea that depression is uh, associated with a loss of neurotrophic support in key brain regions such as the hippocampus. And all effective antidepressant therapies increase the neurotrophic support in brain regions through secondary cascade systems. And oh, I do have a picture, and it's a picture from uh, my buddy Eric Nessler. Uh, and basically the, the point here is that uh, you've got less uh, receptor sites on neurons when you're depressed, uh, and when you're treated, you have more receptor sites. And that's the part of the idea of what makes people better. And a number of things like BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is, think of that as the fertilizer for the brain, helps things grow. Uh, all antidepressants that work will increase BDNF production. Current antidepressant treatment options, we've got antidepressant medications, we've got non-pharmacologic things like actually, God forbid, talking to people. Um, boy, that takes a while. Um, electroconvulsive therapy, phototherapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and vagus nerve stimulation. Uh, and the funny thing is, is given the lack of really novel agents uh, for treatment of depression, I, you know, a good deal of my research is actually with transcranial magnetic stimulation with vagus nerve stimulation. And I'll even show you some really cool data at the end. So these are the new antidepressants that have come out since 1988. And that's all of them. And guess what? They all work through that monoamine hypothesis. And the problem with the whole monoamine hypothesis is there probably are 100 different neurotransmitters that have something to do with depression. We can screw around with two and a half of them. And I say two and a half because I think we're OK with serotonin. We're pretty good with norepinephrine. We really stink with dopamine. We really don't have great dopaminergic antidepressants. So even on the whole list, uh, you know, bupropion tries to bill itself as dopaminergic. I'm not convinced it is terribly dopaminergic. The selegiline transdermal, which is an MAO inhibitor uh, in a transdermal delivery system, is dopaminergic. But that's it. Everything else is either serotonergic or uh, aminergic or both. I hate these bills. There we go. I went beyond it. Come on. Okay. Uh, 50 to 60 percent of depressed patients respond to any given antidepressants, and 80 to 95 percent respond to one or more of a combination of therapeutic interventions if multiple therapies are tried. Uh, half of uh, depressed patients will experience a remission within six months of an index case of depression. Perhaps more than 75 percent will remit by two years. Uh, antidepressants appear effective in reducing relapse rate. I gotta say, you know, I just see the people who don't respond. And I think that the, the, the main goal for you guys is to figure out 
two agents that you can use before you decide to get some help uh, with what to do, and I'll try to give you enough background on that. But pretty much, you know, you start with an SSRI. I would tend to tell you to move to an SNRI. Uh, and then, you know, if you're uh, at your level of mastery, you know, move, move things along. The percentage of patients who remain well during the 18-month period following successful treatment is disappointingly low. In one study, and this is an old study, uh, but it's not as though our antidepressants are actually more effective in 2016 than they were in, in 1992. Uh, next piece of bad news. Uh, 19 to 30 percent in one study. At least 20 percent of treatment naive patients failed to achieve a remission with even four sequential treatment trials with monotherapy and combinations. That was the STARDE study that uh, John Rush was the um, was 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 a lot of the the, the brain power behind that study. Uh, more than half of patients fail to ever attain remission in acute trials, and those that do commonly may not sustain remission. You know, I would just as soon not have job security. Uh, I'd be really okay if we were able to treat this, and I'd be happy to do something else. So here we're looking at the side effects from all this stuff. So the serotonergic side effects, number one and two, GI side effects, bear in mind there are many more serotonin receptors in the gut than there are in the brain. The brain actually is, has very few serotonin receptors. Uh, it's only a small area of the brain that has lots of serotonin receptors, dorsal raphae nucleus. Uh, sexual dysfunction, very common side effect. Uh, you'll see many more complaints from men than from women about it, and it's not that women actually experience it less, they just complain of it less. Um, and as well, if you look at the package insert, uh, anybody knows what the package insert will say is the incidence of sexual dysfunction for, let's say, fluoxetine? It says 1.9%. Anybody believe that number? And why does that number exist? Because the FDA has decided that uh, the only things that get listed are spontaneous reports. So because guys didn't come in and say, you know, <laughs> this medication's a problem. Uh, that they only report that if they're asked about it. And uh, that's unfortunate. Um, but it also got me in a fight with the people who made paroxetine when I suggested they ask about it. And uh, they ushered me out of the room. Um, uh, sleep disturbance with long-term use, you can see weight gain, suppression of dopamine transmission may lead to a decrease in the ability to experience pleasure. And you can see some apathy with some of these folks. Uh, neuroadrenergic side effect, tremor, tachycardia. I will also add uh, hypertension, uh, particularly for one of the newer ones, levomilnasopran, at least during the study. I had a fairly high incidence of causing hypertension, which I don't mind. I'm willing to treat the hypertension uh, if it makes people better. Uh, dopaminergic side effects, uh, psychomotor activation, aggravation of psychosis. So all these work on monoamines. They take three to eight weeks to be maximally effective. All have equivalent response rates and remission rates. All have serotonin or noradrenergic side effects. And the placebo drug differences are greatest in the more severe depression. So if you start off with sicker folks, they're more likely to get better than the people who are less sick. Uh, by the way, exercise works as well as any antidepressant for mild to moderate depression. Uh, the current SSRIs, uh, that's them. Uh, the, that's their recommended dose range. Um, the only one I really disagree with is Zoloft. I actually commonly am above 200 milligrams. I'm often at two to 300 milligrams. Uh, I forget if I put this slide in the kit, so I'll just mention that uh, the three that I use more commonly than all the others uh, are Celexa, Lexapro, and Prozac probably account for 80% of all my prescriptions uh, for uh, SSRIs and probably prefer Celexa or Lexapro even to Prozac because it's real simple. It's a pure SSRI with very little other activity. 
and they're all off patent, they're all generic, and they're all cheap. Uh, this is the uh, uh, likely weight gain. The one with the worst weight gain is paroxetine, which had a six uh, pound mean weight gain. Uh, second is mirtazapine, which had a four pound weight gain. Don't tend to use either of those uh, much. Uh, actually, PCPs like paroxetine much more than I do because it will help some of the anxiety features more than some of the other things. And uh, fluoxetine actually had a, uh, uh, on average, a little bit of weight loss, as did bupropion. Oh, I do have a slide in here. So uh, fluoxetine, my, these are my preferred SSRIs, long half-life of two weeks. It's a 2D6 inhibitor, it's more effective. If I see somebody with obsessional symptoms, I'm more likely to use uh, fluoxetine. Uh, got easy dosing. Citalopram is uh, cheap and simple. Um, escitalopram is just the S isomer of citalopram. Uh, there's a question whether it actually has a better side effect profile than citalopram. You certainly have my permission to use citalopram. Citalopram came under fire a little bit because of uh, ECG abnormalities at 40 milligram and above. So the FDA was bitching about that for a while, warned that everybody should get ECGs, and then they took the warning away. Uh, so you can use 40 milligrams again without getting an ECG. Less preferred, uh, paroxetine has the worst side effect profile with weight gain, somnolence, and sexual side effects. Highest rate of discontinuation uh, syndrome. This is because of nonlinear pharmacokinetics, which I won't discuss more, but it's just that it inhibits its own metabolization. So when you uh, take somebody off of it, uh, the last step is the doozy. Sertraline, I find, often requires a dose titration to 150 to 300 milligrams. And the biggest problem with sertraline is it's, is it's harder to use because you generally start people at 50 and work up to a higher dose. Fluvoxamine um, may have a better efficacy for OCD, but a much higher risk of weight gain and GI distress. Again, don't tend to use it outside of OCD. There are two new antidepressants. Uh, the Lazadone has some postsynaptic 5-HC1, partial agonism, high incidence of GI side effects. They're trying to build themselves as having a lower risk of sexual dysfunction. I haven't found it. Um, it's a very high price point versus ge a generic SSRI. Um, Vortioxetine, which is uh, advertising extensively uh, these days, uh, it changed its name from Brintelix to Trintelix because people were confusing it with something else. Uh, it's got postsynaptic activity at five different serotonin receptors. They're trying to be able to market for cognitive improvement, so you'll see a, there's a lot of DTC advertising that they're doing. And again, it's a very high price point versus generic. Uh, the, the place for these is, uh, if it's affordable, is before you move to an SN, SNRI, because I think these do have better side effect profiles than the SNRI, the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Uh, but again, at very high price point. Uh, here are the SNRIs. Uh, Effexor requires extensive dose titration from 37.5 milligrams to 225 milligrams over weeks. You'll see more serotonin than norepinephrine reuptake blockade. Uh, uh, there's also the first metabolite of Effexor is available as a se separate drug, uh, desvenlafaxin. Uh, there's no significant dose titration. It, it is expensive, but you can basically park it at 50 or 100 milligrams. So you can start it in, uh, at an effective dose. My personal favorite um, is duloxetine, uh, and it is equally serotonergic and norepinephrine uh, reuptake blockade. You can start it at 60, but I usually start at 30 and titrate it to 60 as uh, GI tolerability occurs. Uh, there's also levomilnasoprine, which is more norepi than serotonin, serotonergic, and it's got a significant rate of hypertension. This is expensive. You use it at 48 or 100. Bupropion markets itself as a DNRI, a dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, but it doesn't really have a low enough KI to be a compelling argument, so I would argue that the mechanism of action is unknown. KI is what the binding potential is, uh, and the lower KIs means that your drug has more affinity for a receptor site.
It tends to be used more as an add-on agent by psychiatrists rather than as primary treatment. It's generally weight neutral and no sexual side effects. Uh, some decrease in seizure threshold. Um, don't find it to be terribly, I don't find it as effective as an SSRI, but it certainly is a better side effect profile. Tricyclic antidepressants, that's what we had when I first came up uh, in psychiatry. I thought it was, if there is a God, he has a very ironic sense of humor that he would make the one antidepressant I had really difficult to uh, deal with an overdose. Um, it may be more effective than SSRIs in melancholic depression. You need titration to reach a therapeutic dose. There's a clear window of efficacy for nortriptyline with likely ranges for other tricyclics. Lots of side effects. These are generally quite anticholinergic drugs. Highly lethal in overdose. Basically, a 10-day supply of this taken at once will be lethal, largely because of uh, cardiac conductivity issues. These are the only tricyclic agents you even need to think about ever. Uh, which would be the two tertiary amines, amipramine and amitriptyline, which are both much more anticholinergic. Uh, I can't think of the last time I prescribed either of those. Uh, I do still use desipramine and nortriptyline. Um, can't say that they're commonly used by psychiatrists anymore, but again, they're cheap as dust. Uh, and they do work, but they do have a higher incidence of weight gain. It's amazing how many people are more afraid of weight gain than severe depression. Um, <laughs> TCA side effects, as I mentioned, dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision, urinary retention, hypotension, sedation, weight gain, sexual um, adverse events, and cardiac conduction events. This is, uh, again, what I consider to be the adequate treatment uh, to verify a failed trial. I generally want people on something for six weeks and I want them on at least uh, these minimum doses to decide that they've had an adequate trial of any of these. And I would argue the Venlafax, and I really want to see people on 225. It's not approved to 300, but I will commonly use it at 300. You just have to check blood pressure. Does Venlafax, and I don't know, I put the question mark because I'm not sure whether it needs to be 100 or whether 50 is really sufficient. Bupropion 300, Mertazin 345. <laughs> Unless there's a compelling reason not to use an SSRI, that should be the first agent. If no effect, switch to an SNRI or bupropion. You also have my permission to move to another SSRI. And if only a partial effect, consider augmentation. The common augmentation strategies, uh, lithium, I, I want, you know, so there was a lot of uh, literature about use of lithium augmentation in depression. I really wonder if those were settled by polars uh, that got better. No, no, but I'm suspicious. Uh, thyroid, I generally will treat uh, people who are subclinically hypothyroid. So I will tend to treat people who just are at the high level of the range for TSH. Atypical antipsychotics, they're most used and aggressively marketed, but really high cost and side effect burden. I'll, I'll tell you a funny conversation I had with a friend of mine when I was uh, going to a meeting that uh, was giving the results of the phase two trial of basically the combination of uh, buprenorphine and samidorphine. So buprenorphine uh, is uh, subutex, um, an opiate agonist antagonist mixed with a pure opiate antagonist. And I said, is there a market for an opiate to be used, uh, even an opiate antagonist to be used for depression? And my friend said, okay, it's you. You have failed your antidepressant, and you have to move on to another antidepressant. Would you rather be on uh, buprenorphine and samidorphine, or would you rather be on an atypical? And I said, holy cow, you're <coughs> absolutely right. I would rather be on an opiate agonist antagonist than, I, than be on an atypical if it was me. So uh, I'll be interested to see how it happens. We'll be doing another phase three trial coming up. Um, stimulants can be used. Uh, the problem is uh, that they can be abused. 
Uh, and they're better for low energy, poor concentration versions of depression. <coughs> uh, antidepressant combinations I typically will use would be things like SSRIs and bupropion or an SSRI and a tricyclic. There's a combination of mirtazapine and venlafaxin that my buddy Steve Stahl would call California rocket fuel because you're basically working presynaptically and postsynaptically on serotonin and norepinephrine with this. Um, he's had better luck with it than I have. Uh, I have had a huge amount of luck with it. Mirtazapine has, in, mirtazapine is one of those drugs that I like more in paper than on real life. I love its binding profile. It's got a really interesting uh, pharmacokinetics. It's largely a presynaptic blocker of the alpha-2 autoreceptor. That'll be on the quiz, just like um, which increases serotonin release. But it's got a lot of histamine and muscarinic binding, which gives it a problematic side effect profile, sedation and weight gain. Uh, MAO inhibitors, uh, the uh, most psychiatrists no longer use MAO inhibitors because they're hard to use. Uh, it is the only monotherapy which does provide dopaminergic support, broad spectrum agent, but very problematic drug drug and drug food interactions. Neuromodulation. Certainly ECT is commonly uh, used and paid for by insurers. We do a ton of ECT at Shepherd Pratt. We treat between 20 and 30 people a day uh, with ECT. And basically ECT is causing a seizure uh, in folks. It's the single most effective treatment for depression. It's got a high side effect burden. The problem is that 65% of the people who respond are, are sick within six months. Uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation is getting increasing attention. Insurers are lessening their resistance, but the cost is high, and it requires generally 30 treatments over six weeks. So I'm treating people five days a week for six weeks. Uh, no anesthesia. It's very, very well tolerated, but uh, um, very time consuming. Vagus nerve stimulation. This is an implantable device. Uh, I'm going to be reporting on uh, five-year data, which I'll show you a little bit of, uh, just because, not that it's as important to you as it is to me, uh, but uh, I'm the first author on, uh, on a bunch of papers on this. Uh, and the point is, is that I'm able to treat people who even fail ECT. Yeah, really cool. So this is actually my uh, data. Uh, so this is looking at people over five years implanted with VNS. So the, to get into my study, you needed to have failed at least four treatments. Average number of failures was eight. And I'm talking about well-documented treatments. And basically, patients could choose whether they got treatment as usual at an academic medical center or be implanted with a device. And this is my five-year data. So this is my cumulative response data. You can see that my cumulative response data is almost twice as high for people implanted with the device than people who did not have the device. And I've got a p-value of less than 0 0.001. And my, uh, my n, by the way, is 500 people with the device and 300 people getting treatment as usual. This is my data on people who have responded to ECT historically and people who have not responded to ECT. So you can see that even my uh, patients who did not respond to ECT, I've got a 60% response rate with VNS in people that we've got no other options for. Uh, and you can see that I do better. Uh, so you, what I'm comparing is the blue and the green. I'm a little colorblind. I apologize if I get the colors wrong. So the blue and the green is the uh, uh, ECT responders. The red and the purple are the ECT non-responders. And like I said, this is five-year data. So I think that's pretty cool. So uh, I'm going to finish up and, and open up for questions. And I did pretty well on time. I really spoke fast. Um, Verify the target symptoms, have a low threshold to consider the presence of bipolar psychotic symptoms, make sure all drug trials are of adequate dose and duration, remission gives much better long-term results and response, and I think that the frontier of uh, mood disorder treatment is neuromodulation and expansion beyond the monoamine hypothesis, at least that's what I'm banking uh, the resources of my research program on. Thank you.